Thank you for joining us for an overview of the first New Testament book of the Bible, the Gospel of Matthew. The New Testament begins with four gospel accounts, and the word gospel simply means good news. And in these four books, penned by four different authors, we receive the good news of the life of Jesus Christ. And this good news is news to every man and woman in the world for every time, for every nationality, for every age. It is the good news of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the significance of that. So as we look at the first book of the New Testament, we will do a quick overview by asking ourselves a few questions. Who was the author of the book? Who wrote the book? When was it written? What are the main themes in the book? To whom did the author intend to write the book? And then what is the structure of the book? With the Lord's help, this material will help you study and look into the book of Matthew and grab more details as you understand the bigger picture of the gospel of Matthew. So the first question, who wrote the book? When the early manuscripts of the first New Testament book of the Bible were recovered, they had a title or an inscription at the top, according to Matthew. And in church history and in church tradition, there is strong evidence to believe that the author of the first New Testament book was the disciple of Jesus Christ, Matthew himself. And the name Matthew in the Jewish language means gift of Jehovah. What a beautiful name. And truly, Matthew is a gift of God to us because God used him as a vessel to share with us the beautiful story of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Matthew himself writes about his own encounter with Jesus and how he met him. And in chapter 9, verse 9, we can read that for ourselves and let's do that. Matthew 9, verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. That means he was a tax collector. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. So the Bible clearly shares with us, and Matthew himself tells the story, that he left his occupation of being a tax collector for the Romans in order to follow Jesus. At the time, the Jewish people hated the Romans, and anyone who worked for them, even if he was a Jew himself, was despised. And so Matthew collected taxes in a town uh, at the northern tip of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, uh, called Capernaum. That is where Matthew met with Jesus Christ. The interesting thing that we find about that is that in Matthew 17, verses 24 through 27, Matthew himself records the story of Jesus paying the temple tax. Out of the four Gospels, the only author who records that story is Matthew. Isn't that interesting? Tax collectors amongst the Galileans were probably most apt to, to be able to take notes. And as we look at the book of Matthew, there are many beautiful, long discourses that Matthew records for us. And I believe that the Holy Spirit, as Matthew was penning those words, was, was reminding him of the teachings of Jesus Christ in his heart and in his mind, because the Word of God is breathed by God. But I also believe that God uses the skills and abilities that he himself gives to people to be a blessing to others. And I believe Matthew, as he was listening to the teachings of Jesus, as he was walking with Jesus, very possibly he was able to take notes and to record a few things. Matthew receives the call to follow Jesus in chapter 9, verse 9. And then in chapter 10, we read that Matthew is now one of the disciples of Jesus, one of the twelve, and his name is listed in that passage. We read that also in the books of Mark and the Gospel of Luke as well. And so as Matthew becomes a disciple of Jesus, he is an eyewitness of the ministry and the life of Jesus. He follows him 
he listens to him. He walks with him. He develops a relationship with Jesus, and he records all of that for us to read. And the Holy Spirit and God, by his grace, preserves that word so that it comes to us and that we can hold it in our hands and read Gospels and the account of um, Matthew. Tradition states that Matthew preached in, in Judea for about 15 years, and then he went as a missionary to foreign countries, and including Ethiopia, Persia, and Parthia. So we get to this question of when was this Gospel of Matthew written? And most scholars believe that it was written between the early 40s to mid 60s. But to be more precise, some place it at AD 58 to 68. What is interesting about that is in the book of Matthew, specifically in the Olivet Discourse, we see Christ teaching on the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. And all of these prophecies of Jesus Christ were fulfilled. But the writings of those prophecies were given earlier before their fulfillment. And so people knew that what Jesus had said had come to pass. And so the writings were done prior to AD 70 when there was the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem itself. As we come to this point of the main themes or the purposes that we see within the book, there are many, but some stand out more than others. And I would like to touch on just two th of the main themes that we see run through all of the book of Matthew. And the first one is that Jesus of Nazareth is the one who fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. We can clearly see that because Matthew goes back and quotes from the Old Testament scriptures on many, many occasions so that the Jew reading those new Old, Te Old Testament scriptures would look at Jesus Christ and see, wow, Jesus fits into all of these things. He is the Messiah. So the first thing that Matthew begins with is that the Messiah will be from the lineage of Abraham and King David. And then the book begins with that when we look at matthew chapter 1 verse 1 we read this the book of the generation of jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham it is important to note that the to fulfill the scriptures the messiah needed to be from the line of abraham and the line of david there were promises given to abraham which you can read in genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 and then you can also read in the book of 2 Samuel, verses 7 through 11, verses 11 through 16, in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, promises given to David. And both these promises involved the heir or the seed, their seed that will be king, their seed that will be the Messiah of the world. And Jesus fulfills that promise as he is in the line of both Abraham and and David. So Matthew traces this lineage of Jesus through the lineage of Abraham and King David, and that's the reason why we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And if you're reading the book of Matthew for the first time, you might find it a bit awkward to read through all these names, and you ask yourself, why is it here? Well, it's so important for the Jew to understand that there's a connection between Jesus and the Messiah, and the Old Testament prophecies, and they fit. The interesting thing is that in the book of Matthew, the term son of David is used nine times, and that is to consolidate the idea that Jesus Christ is from the line of David, and he's the rightful heir of David. So, the second point that Matthew makes is that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. And the prophecies of Isaiah in chapter 7 verse 14 speak of the Messiah being born of a virgin. And Matthew records this beautiful story, Matthew chapter 1 verses 22 through 23, that Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary. 
the prophecy of Micah in chapter 5 verse 2 speak about the Messiah who will be born in Bethlehem. And Matthew records the story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem in chapter 2 verse 6. Can you imagine the Jew reading the first New Testament book, the Gospel of Matthew, and sitting there and contemplating these things and realizing that the Jesus who they have rejected, their Messiah, is actually the one who was promised, and he actually fulfills the prophecies. The Messiah will be called out of Egypt. We read about that in the prophetic book of Hosea. And Hosea the prophet speaks in chapter 11 verse 1 that the Messiah will be called out of Egypt. And we know that Jesus was called out of Egypt after Joseph and Mary fled there with baby Jesus from the wrath of Herod. You remember this story in Matthew chapter 2 verse 15 we see that fulfillment as Herod dies Jesus and Joseph his, um, and Mary, his mother, come back to the land of Judea. The Bible also clearly teaches us that the Messiah will bring light to the region of Galilee. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we have that prophecy. But the fulfillment of that prophecy comes in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, where Jesus, at around the age of 30, moves to Capernaum and establishes his ministry in that region, in the region of Galilee. And Capernaum was at the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus spent roughly 70 to 75 percent of his ministry time serving the people in that region. And so in a very spiritual dark place, light has shone and the prophecies were fulfilled. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. There was another prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 that the Messiah will bear the griefs of his people and carry their sorrows. And as Matthew records Jesus casting out demons from those who were possessed and healing the sick, he says this is the fulfillment of the prophecies in Matthew chapter 8 verses 16 through 17. The Messiah will teach us people using parables. And we read, this, we read this prophecy in Psalm 78, verse 2. And Matthew records to us many parables of Jesus. And Jesus taught people using parables. And in Matthew 13, verses 35, 34 through 35, we read the, how Matthew records that this is the fulfillment of the prophecies. There was an, another prophecy given by the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. And that prophecy dealt with the fact that the Messiah will come to Jerusalem riding upon a donkey. So Matthew records in chapter 21 the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem with great triumph, riding upon a donkey. And he was received with great excitement. And that is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. So you can read that in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 through 11. Another prophecy that Matthew points out as the fulfillment and the validation that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah is that the Messiah will be valued at 30 pieces of silver. And that is prophesied in the book of Zechariah the prophet in chapter 11 verses 12 through 13 and in Matthew chapter 26 verses 14 through 16 and then verses 1 through 10 of chapter 27 Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and we can read that story of how Judas one of his disciples betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. Again, you can only imagine as the the first century Jews sitting there and reading the book of Matthew, what is going on in their mind as they're realizing that all of the prophecies of old are fulfilled in this man whose name is Jesus. The last prophecy that Matthew points to 
as the validation that Jesus is the promised Messiah is that the Messiah will be crucified. He will be, he will be a suffering Messiah and his garments will be divided and lots will be cast for his clothing. And that prophecy is given to us in Psalm 22, verse 18. And then Matthew records the story of Jesus at his crucifixion, seeing how the soldiers at his cross are dividing his garments, are casting lots for his clothing. And if you'd like to read that, it's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. So the first main theme of the Gospel of Matthew is that Jesus of Nazareth is the one who fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. But the second theme that we see runs through the whole of the book of the Gospel of Matthew is that Jesus is the King who brings the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven on earth. And the term kingdom of heaven is used 33 times in the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of God, that term, is used five times in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew makes it very clear that Jesus is the long-awaited king of the long-awaited kingdom of God. So those are the two main themes. There are others, and there are many more details, but um, those are the two main themes that we see in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, when we look and ask ourselves, to whom did Matthew write this book, we realize that most likely Matthew's audience was a Jewish audience. That's probably who he had in mind as he was writing this gospel. Because when we look at the book, we see there are many, many Old Testament quotes. And Matthew quotes and refers from the Old Testament more often than any other New Testament author. And Matthew was writing this book having in mind the Jewish audience. But the Holy Spirit, as Matthew is writing to the Jews and others who would believe in Jesus Christ, of course, he preserves the Word of God through centuries so that when we read it, we can look at the prophecies of old and see that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the King, and that He brought the Kingdom of God on earth, and that there will be a time when all will submit to His rule and to His reign. So when we ask ourselves the question of what is the structure of the book of Matthew, this will help us get a just a an overview and a, and a bird's eye view of the book. And the structure is really, really beautiful in this book. Um, Matthew begins with a narrative of the birth of Jesus and ends with a narrative of his betrayal, his sufferings on the cross for our sins, and his death on the cross, his burial, and then his resurrection. But in between those two narratives, there are five sections in which there are five main discourses or teachings or sayings of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is that Matthew made it very easy for us to track those sections by finishing those sections with a saying, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings. That, that's the phrase that Matthew uses to end every main discourse in these five sections. And so I want us to take a quick look at these five main sections. So as we said, there is a narrative of or a storyline of the birth of Jesus, then the five main discourses of Jesus, and then a narrative or a storyline of the last few days of Jesus Christ here on earth, and what he came, what he accomplished, he accomplished what he came to do. And so the first discourse, the first section, the first teaching is the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 7, 28, when that section is concluded, when that discourse is concluded, we hear um, these words. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. That's the end of the first section. The second section is the commission of the twelve apostles. 
preceding their first preaching journey. And we read in Matthew 11, verse 1, these words, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Again, and it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, that is the end of that section, second discourse or, or second section. The third one we see is the parables of the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 53, we read the conclusion of the end of that discourse. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. So that's the end of that third section. The fourth section is on the teaching of Jesus on the necessity of humility and forgiveness. And in Matthew chapter 19, verse 1, we read again a very similar saying, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. Isn't that interesting? The fifth uh, section is the Olivet Discourse, or the time when Jesus describes the signs of the second coming, of his second coming. And in Matthew 26, verse 1, we read these words, And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples. So, Matthew structures it in a very Jewish way, because some scholars believe that it mirrors um, the Old Testament writings. And the Old Testament writings begin with the five foundational books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in a very Jewish way, Matthew very possibly could have been mirroring that and structuring his book um, with these five main discourses, five main sections um, in the middle of two narratives. And it is interesting that that's how Matthew records it. And there are other themes and there are other uh, uh, ideas that are mixed in between those discourses, but it helps us to have a structure and to see and understand how the book of Matthew is structured. Um, the 15 uh, parables of Jesus are recorded in the book of Matthew, but 10 of them are not found in other gospels. So the Matthew, besides uh, just the structure. There's a lot of new content within the book of Matthew. It's a very, it's a, it's a big volume. Um, there's a lot of content that's recorded there, which is exclusive to Matthew. There are also 20 miracles of Jesus that are recorded in the book of Matthew, and three of them are not found in any other gospels. So this, these miracles are, are exclusive to Matthew's um, gospel. It is interesting that Matthew concludes his gospel with the Great Commission. And as we've said before, that Matthew served in the land of Judea and ministered and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, but then he became a missionary and went to other countries to share the gospel. So he didn't only record this Great Commission that Christ gave to people, to his disciples, but he actually became a part of that Great Commission by taking the good news of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to other people and to other countries. And we read um, the Great Commission recorded to us in the book of Matthew in chapter 28 and um, verses 18 through 20. But I want to say this, that this Great Commission comes after the sufferings of Jesus and after the, resurrections of, of the resurrection of Christ. Jesus took upon himself our sins. He went to the cross and he was nailed to the cross to pay the penalty for my sin and the penalty for your sin. If we were left alone to pay the penalty for our sin, we would have been eternally separated with a loving God, creator God, in hell. But Jesus came to take upon and to save us from our sins, to take it upon himself. And he bore it in his body on the cross. But he did not stay on the cross. They put him in a tomb. And three days later, Jesus was risen. And when he was risen, it changed everything. 
the disciples, when they saw that the, 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 the man they walked with for three and a half years, they didn't fully understand who he was. But when they saw him dead on the cross and then alive again, they realized this changes everything. The greatest enemy of humanity is death and it is defeated. If Jesus is alive, we have hope in life after death. And then Jesus is Lord. He commands his disciples to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And let us read in conclusion of this brief overview of the gospel of Matthew, the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 says this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's how Matthew finishes his gospel. By the Holy Spirit, there is a call, a commission, purpose and meaning given to the disciple, to the believer of Jesus Christ. Go and share with the whole world the glorious gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is what Matthew is all about.